Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is again that time where we are joined by you on the Word of Truth channel. Uh, this week, we will be discussing the lesson entitled The New Covenant Sanctuary. Our memory text for this evening is therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. A moonless evening, the sky black like spilled ink covered Frank in shadow as he walked the empty urban streets. After a while, he heard footsteps behind him, someone following in the darkness. Then the person caught up with him and said, Frank the printer, yes, I am he. But how did you know? Well, answered the stranger, I don't know you, but I know your brother very well. And even in the darkness, your mannerisms, your way of walking, your figure all reminded me so much of him. I just assumed that you were his brother because he told me that he had one. Now, this story reveals a powerful truth regarding the Israelite sanctuary service. It was the Bible says a shadow of the real. Nevertheless, there was enough in the shadows and images of the earthly sanctuary to clearly foreshadow and reveal the truths they were supposed to represent. Now, for this week, we are going to look at why did God want the Israelites to build a sanctuary? Why does the sanctuary teach us about Christ as our substitute? And what does Jesus do in heaven as our representative? So without much further ado, let me first welcome Brother Tyron and Brother Tepolo. And then I will hand over to Brother Tepolo to take us through the first few days. All right. <clears throat> um, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Brother David, for that. Um, looking at, so I'll be doing Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Now, looking at these days, um, we realize that Sunday starts off by um, giving us an idea about relationship um, and specifically our relationship between the maker of the covenant and also the people receiving the covenant. Now it starts off uh, by giving us Leviticus 26 verse 11 and 12, um, which speaks of the tabernacle and the sanctuary um, being, uh, being there. So that people may do, so that God may dwell amongst his people. Now you you realize very quickly that um, whether you look at the old or the new covenant, that there is a, a, a an urgent that there is a desire, an urgent desire from God to be close to his people, and that um, the covenant that he is forming or the covenant that he forms is one that pushes that a relationship has to be uh, cultivated between um, God and obviously his people. Now, it also becomes interesting to note that, um, that, that, that in order for a relationship to exist, uh, firstly, the covenant, a covenant um, um, needs a relationship, but a relationship needs uh, interaction and communication and also contact. Um, with, with, with all parties uh, concerned. So therefore, um, when, we look at, when, when we look at this particular instance um, of the covenants that have been created, we realize that it is God's um, push to always be with his people, to always be there, especially considering that, number one, we are fallible, number two, we are sinful, and number three, we have a tendency to doubt. Um, and therefore, that relationship then becomes a factor. Now, um, we realize that um, if whether you look through the Genesis account, the Exodus, and all that, that God has always had this desire. And that's why when you read Exodus 25 verse 8, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. Um, once again, showing the desire for God to be close um, to his people and that he wants to be with his people at all times. Now, um, looking at, at Sunday, uh, Sunday, I mean, Monday, sorry, Monday, then looking at um, sin, sacrifice, and acceptance, um, we, we then realize that um, what was constructed then 
was that in order for one to be free or in order for one to be accepted back into the fellowship, if you sinned, that you had to um, do animal sacrifices. Um, we realize that um, sin, sin has a way of cutting you off from the fellowship. And every time you did something sinful, that's why they had called what is known as a sin offering, you would then do that offering and come back uh, or you do the offering and be accepted back into the fold. Um, so therefore, the, the sacrificing um, was, was, very, was very prevalent within that. And it was a way of, 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 of firstly, um, reassuring the covenant or rather, um, bring, or rather reactivating the covenant and then being accepted into the full fellowship with God and humanity through the form of that particular covenant. Um, now, we do know that, um, that sacrifices were ordained or were uh, 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 pre-appointed by God. So, therefore, um, they, they were brought there for the purpose of cleansing the sinner and of transferring the, the, the sin um, onto another, uh, onto another uh, animal, transferring individual sin and guilt to the sanctuary specifically, but then also saying that you accept that you were sinful and that um, you, 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 you want to atone for it. Now, this then becomes important to note, considering that if, um, if we look at how, um, 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 how the Bible, or rather how Christ came, Christ came as that significance of the animal sacrifice that would take away the sins of, 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 of the world. Now, looking specifically at, at what Paul would say in Hebrews 10 verse 4, Paul basically speaks of the fact that it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats um, should take away sin. So therefore, it means that the animal sacrifices was a foreshadowing of a bigger and, and greater sacrifice that would ultimately fulfill the role that uh, the animals are supposed to fulfill. And that we understand being um, the, 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 death and, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. Now, we understand, now looking at Tuesday, Tuesday uh, uh, starts off with a question, um, or rather Tuesday starts off with, with a thought that um, did Jesus volunteer to die? And for whom did he die? Now, looking at, at, at his own statement, at Christ's own statement, um, and looking at Galatians 1 verse 4, um, Christ would be the one who says, I lay down my life and I raise it up again. So that signifies a voluntary action by Christ. So Christ becomes the substitute um, of, 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 of the animals. But also, it is the atonement of Christ's bloodshed that saves humanity's soul. So Christ then, number one, he willingly sacrificed his life. And furthermore, he died for humanity and for the salvation of all the souls. Now, substitution of this is in, in, crucial to the entire plan of salvation because, um, because if you look at Romans, Romans 6, verse 23, is that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So uh, that then gives us the idea the, 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 the scenario that had a substitution not been in place, that death was supposed to be ours. So Christ's death then is, is a substitution of uh, replacing us with himself so that we might be able to inherit uh, eternal life. And then this now also brings us back into the communion fellowship that we have been looking at um, um, in the past uh, two days. Uh, I thank you very much. Ah, on point there, Pastor, on point, Brother Tyron. Uh, would you like to add a comment maybe there? That was fine. I think you can continue. Um, I will, Actually, sir, I will it is, uh, if he finished uh, these three days, uh, we, shall now, we shall now hand over to you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, uh, David. Thank you, uh, Pastor Hilo. Um, yeah, so Wednesday, I'll just touch on um, the new covenant high priest. And 
Um, what is interesting would be, uh, before I get into that, that, you know, the Bible is a very interesting book because the Bible actually shows us, um, if I can put it, how to get your clothes back on. Um, because God shows everything that it's God that does everything. We cannot add anything to the Bible. It's God who saved humanity. And I think the sanctuary is a very, um, I think it's a very, very good study because everything that, that when you study the Bible, everything points to the to the sanctuary and we can see Christ in the sanctuary. So we, we're talking about the new covenant of, of the high priest. And like uh, Tapelo spoke about um, the bulls and goats in the book of um, Hebrews, uh, it's not possible. You know, so the, in the Old Testament, God sets up or rather he tells Moses to, to build a sanctuary that, that he wants to dwell with, with, with his people. But I just want to take you to the book of Isaiah 59, verse 2, uh, just so that we can have a better understanding of the sanctuary, is that um, in the Bible, we, know, we are very acquainted, very, um, there's a well-known verse to us, it says in the book of Isaiah 59, verse 2, and it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. So here we see the condition why God is actually separated and why God tells Moses to build the sanctuary. In fact, we go to the book of Psalm 77, verse 13. And so that we'll have a better understanding of the sanctuary is that God is the one that it sets it up. And, and listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 77, verse 13. It says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And we'll notice there where God is actually having a relationship and communicating or speaking to Moses and in the book of Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 uh, the Bible says and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with, with them so here we see that God wants to dwell with someone he wants to dwell with humanity in the in fact in the, the book of John chapter 1 verse 14 the Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, meaning that God desires to have a relationship with us. Now, when when you go into the in in, in the heavenly sanctuary, or in fact, if you go into the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter chapter nine and verse twenty four, it says here, "For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hand, which are the figures of the true, but into the heaven heavens itself." Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So I just want to take you into the Old Testament. We see that God sets up the sanctuary. And we know that the sun had to go into the court. The court represents the, the earth. And we know that we had to come and take the animal or we had to take our hands and place it on the animal's uh, head. And we had to confess our sin. And our sins is transferred into the innocent animal. And we have to slaughter or we have to slit the animal's throat and the innocent animal dies. We know that that innocent animal done nothing wrong, but because of our sins, our sins uh, caused the animal, the innocent animal to die. And we know that the, the high priest who represents Jesus goes into the holy place. And I want you to notice something that when you come through the gate, what is interesting is that when you come through the sanctuary, it's the gate. And when you look at the Bible, you'll notice that salvation comes through Jesus. So when we enter through the gate, we are entering, we are going through salvation. We're coming or entering through the gate, through salvation, through Christ. So the first thing that we notice at the gate, it is the burnt offering. And what is interesting about the burnt offering is that we meet Christ at the cross. And this is where the lamb was actually burnt. And, 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 it, and, and it shows us that Jesus was the one who died for, for the sons of the world. And once we accept Jesus, we move on into the sanctuary. And we notice there is something that is powerful that we'll notice that all of us went through, and that is baptism or the lava or basin, where we had to be cleansed, we had to be baptized. And this is was everything in the sanctuary in the in the in the court. Um, and then what will happen is the high priest will move in. And what is interesting, and I'm just trying to, sh to highlight a few things so that we have a better understanding of the sanctuary. Um, we will notice in the in the holy place there is something called the candlestick. Now, I don't have to go. I don't have enough time to go to, in the depths of this. But what what the, the candlestick represents um, is actually the light. And then what is light? 
There's also oil, oil that is used to keep the, the light burning. And this was the symbol of the, of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in, in, in the book of John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. So that light represents Christ. Um, and then the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And then right opposite, on your right hand side, you will have the, the table of showbread that represents Jesus in the in the book of Exodus and in the New Testament. You will notice that, that God said, I will, I will reign this man of the bread of life. And we'll notice that Jesus said, I'm this bread, the bread of life. And notice what he says in John chapter 6, verse 51. Jesus says, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live. So the whole idea of the sanctuary points us to Jesus because we'll notice that sin separates us from God. And so God is the one who sets it up. He shows us exactly right in the sanctuary that this is how I'm going to save humanity. And we know as we move further in the, the altar of incense where we have to, um, you know, the, we have to pray and the prayer will go up to the incense to God and he will hear our prayers. And we'll move into the most holy place. We'll be talking about the Ark of the Covenant or the Ten Commandments. But I want to touch quickly on something that is very, very critical. I think it's very important in our study. Is that we still have people today that, that still kill animals, right? And, and we, have, we have people that still, we're still living only in kind of in the, the New Testament. And we get people that's only living in the Old Testament. But I want to show you, I want you to come to, uh, to Friday and understand when it's speaking about Jesus. When the Bible says that it is not possible for bulls and goats to take away sin. I just want you to think about it. It's not, a, it's not possible that a bull and a goat can take away sin. So why can't a bull and why can't a, a goat take away our sin? Because when you study the Bible and notice that a created being cannot die, it cannot pay the, the price for humanity, it cannot pay the, the penalty for sin. And so a bull and a goat cannot, God was stressing this to show them that this was something that's just going to represent the Lamb of God that's going to take away of the sin of the world. So God wanted the, oh, the Israelites or at least people that studying the Bible to have a better understanding that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for humanity. He's the one who pays the price. And so the sanctuary gives us an idea. In fact, Jesus in, in, is right now in the most holy place. And we don't have enough time to go through that today. But Jesus is in the high priest. And he's the one who communicates right now according to the Bible. And you can go through the book of Hebrews where the Bible speaks about the high priest. and speaks about Jesus communicating, ministering before the Father. And so Jesus pleads and he pleads in the heavenly sanctuary that even though we fall short, and this is, the, this is what I love of the sanctuary, that, that sometimes we think that our sins, we, God cannot forgive us, but this is why Jesus is in the most holy place. That even when we fall short of God's glory, that we can confess our sins. The Bible says if you confess your sins, Jesus will forgive. And we need to believe that. That doesn't mean we need to go tomorrow and sin again, but the idea is that Jesus confessed our sins before the Father. This is the sanctuary that we, we're talking about, what is very uh, powerful. But I want you to notice when sin entered the world, that there was only one person that could pay the ultimate price, and that was Christ, because he was the, the one who was equal with the Father. He was equal. He was the only one that could pay the price for for humanity, not even an angel could pay the price because an angel is the same as a bull and a goat they are created. The Bible is clear that only the creator, the one who created you and me, is the only one who could, who could pay the, the, the price, who could step down and become human. And so my prayer is that we will study the, you know, the sanctuary further. Um, I think it's a very powerful um, study. But I also think that <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of people that really don't, don't really understand the sanctuary. And I think by God's grace, David, we, we should, you know, uh, do a Bible study. I think it will be good on maybe on a, a one afternoon something just to touch on the sanctuary, just to go in depth to understand that 
the sanctuary is vital to our belief and our faith. So I'll just leave it for now. And uh, yeah, thank you, God bless. Thank you so much, Brother Tyron. And I don't think one afternoon will be, be enough. I think we should maybe have a, yeah. an entire week dedicated to that. Definitely. But I just have a short something I want to read that summarizes what both of you have so eloquently put. The earthly sanctuary symbolizes the work of salvation that still goes on today. Christ stands in the role of our high priest, mediating before God in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. His purity stands worthy before God in place of our unworthy sinful natures. And it's with that that I want to thank both Brother uh, Topolo and Brother Tyron for, for taking us through the sanctuary in such an eloquent way, as I said. Um, can I just ask Brother Topolo to close for us in prayer, please? Okay, let us pray. Our gracious, kind, loving Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for the unimpressive given us that we may study the lesson. We ask that you may help us to be able to have understood what was said and that that it was fruitful and that everyone will be able to grasp the lesson. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.